Have you ever thought about what hydrocarbons do for us each and every day? International travel was difficult back in 1620. That year a group of separatists, about 90 of them, boarded the ship the Mayflower with a crew of 30. Those of course were the pilgrims. It took them 25 days to cross the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, two of the passengers died on the trip. Today you can make that trip in under seven hours in a plane that carries 300 people. And each and every day, 25,000 planes carry 9 million passengers, a combined total of 10 billion miles. And all of those people are powered by aviation fuel from petroleum. Back in 1898, they held the first urban planning conference in New York City. Members from major cities uh, all over the world came to try and solve an impossible problem. It wasn't housing, wasn't poverty, wasn't education. The impossible problem they were trying to solve was horse manure. <laughs> because through the 1800s, the omnibus taxi services became increasingly popular. And by 1890, the average New Yorker was taking 297 horse carriage rides a year. There were 200,000 horses in New York City, each depositing 15 to 30 pounds of manure per day on the streets or in the stables, for a total of three to six million pounds every day. And it was piling up in the vacant lots. And the uh, news media said uh, within a few decades it would be up to the ninth and 10th story of all the buildings. Well, we all know what happened. The horseless carriage came, around, came along and indeed, the automobile was regarded as a pollution control device in those days. Quite a difference today, is it not? Well, the delegates left this, uh, this conference uh, in a, without being able to solve this problem. But today, petroleum and diesel fuel and gasoline from petroleum powers more than a billion automobiles across our planet. Historically, world trade has been by camel by horse-drawn wagon, by sail. And though trade has grown throughout all of human history, by 1900 its value was only about $10 billion in today's dollars. But since 1900, trade has increased an astonishing 1,800 times to a total of $18 trillion by 2013. Each day, a hundred million tons of freight is shipped by plane, by ship, by truck, or by train. And more than 90% of that is powered by fuel from petroleum. Now, Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte had a problem back in the early 1800s. And it had nothing to do with what was in his vest. <laughs> Napoleon was marching all over Europe, but the food he was carrying with his armies was spoiling. So he gave a reward of 12,000 francs in 1809 to anyone who could find a way to preserve the food for his armies. And a French chef by the name of Nicolas Appert came up with the idea that if he sterilized food first and then put it in tin containers and sealed them, the food would last a long time. And of course, these were the first tin cans uh, just two years later, the cylindrical tin can was patented in Britain. And um, now these are interesting things. They had these uh, tin cans. They forced the food into them through a little hole, sealed them with solder. But since the can opener wasn't open till, it wasn't invented till 1875, the only way you could open these things was with a hammer and chisel. <laughs> and throughout human history, we've packaged food in animal skins, in paper, in wooden crates, in glass, and in metal containers. But today, we package these in plastics. Every day, approximately two million plastic bottles and 1.3 billion plastic bags are consumed across the world. Now many say that this is a bad thing, but this offers tremendous convenience, uh, tremendous cleanliness, tremendous health benefits for the people across the world, and all of these plastics come from hydrocarbons. Ignaz Semmelweis 
was an 18th century physician in Hungary, and he was studying a problem called birthbed fever. Women who came to hospitals were contracting a fever which was often fatal. And he learned that at different hospitals there were different rates of fever, and he hypothesized that the women were actually contracting this fever from physicians because of unclean procedures. And so he began requiring the physicians at his hospital to wash their hands in chlorinated lime solution. And when he did so, the incidence of the fever went down by more than 90%. But Semmelweis was rejected by the medical profession. He was dismissed from his hospital. He started writing letters. By the way, this was before the, uh, theory, the germ theory of disease of Louis Pasteur. He started writing letters to the medical profession and they became to think that he was mad. Even his wife thought he was insane. And the sad story was that in 1865, he was committed to an asylum and he was beaten to death only 14 days later by the inmates. William Stewart Halstead was a great American surgeon in the late 1800s. He did the first gallbladder operation in the United States. He performed some of the first transfusions. He experimented with cocaine as an anesthetic, himself became addicted, his addiction was converted to morphine, and he remained an addict for all of his life, but he still was able to perform as a physician. And Halstead was a champion of uh, sterile procedures, and he wore the first latex surgical gloves and required his teams to do so. Today, plastics from hydrocarbons are replacing uh, surgical gloves, and also used in thousands of other ways in more than a half a million inpatient, inpatient surgeries every day. Heart valves, hip replacements, catheters, bandages, thousands and thousands of uses. Modern medicine would not be what it is today without the essential ingredients of hydrocarbons. And historically, energy has come from wood, come from human and animal muscle power with a little bit of wind and coal thrown in there. Since 1900, we've entered a golden age of low-cost energy. Global energy use has increased 26 times since 1900. And of course, we now have electricity, and our modern society is computerized and driven by electricity. And today, hydrocarbons provide more than 80% of that energy. When did energy use become bad? About once a quarter, I get a message from Commonwealth Edison, my electrical utility, called a home energy report. And it says something like, you use 41% more electricity than your most efficient neighbors. <laughs> well, thank you. I used the electricity that I wanted to use. And I think I'm... Uh, pretty stingy with electricity. I like to say my wife and I have a symbiotic relationship. She turns the lights on and I turn them off. <laughs> but uh, right on the Commonwealth Edison site, they have the power bandit. And they say saving energy was never so much fun. Beat the power bandit and learn lots of ways to save energy, save money, and help save the planet. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there is no evidence that using less energy saves the environment.